Today's crime took place in Polk County, Florida. And there are some pretty interesting facts about Polk County. For instance, Florida being the second largest orange juice producer in the world, with approximately 76,000 Floridians working in the citrus industry. It's an $8.6 billion industry with Tropicana, Minute Maid, and Florida's Natural processing their juice in Polk County. Phosphate mining's been an economic pillar for Polk County since the 1800s. The very first Publix was opened in Polk County in 1935. But there's nobody more interesting or famous in the county than Sheriff Grady Judd, who's been a part of the Sheriff's Department since 1972. And he would have been on the force at the time of today's crime. Unless you're a criminal, you probably appreciate his no-nonsense approach. And I'll leave you with a few of his quotes. They tried to treat us with fentanyl, and we tricked them with an arrest. And when a puzzled reporter questioned why Polk County Sheriff's SWAT team shot a cop killer 68 times, Sheriff Grady replied, that's all the bullets we had. And forcing your way into an occupied residence is a bold and foolish decision. And if you're foolish enough to break into someone's home, the people of Polk County like guns. They have guns, and I encourage them to have guns. And they're going to be in their homes tonight with their guns loaded. And if you try to break into their homes to steal or set fires, I highly recommend they blow you back out of the house with their gun. We've caught 100% of murderers in the last eight years, so just pack up your murdering butt and leave the county. There's always room in our crossbar hotel. I'm Darlene. And I'm Melody. This is Hard Times and True Crimes. Today, I wanted to give you an update on the Gretchen Harrington case. Oh, yes. We did that one almost a year ago. We did it last August. It was episode 26. Mm -hmm. Just a reminder for our listeners that this was the nine-year-old little girl who was abducted on her way to church. Yes. And 50 years later, the pastor of that church was actually arrested, Pastor David Zanstra. He was uh, denied bail, thankfully. In December, he was arraigned. He was charged with criminal homicide, murder in the first, second, and third degree. Oh, And also charged with possession of an instrument of crime. Okay. I don't know what that was. Yeah, that's very curious after 50 years. So I just wanted to let you know, uh, right now, you know, he he confessed because he was faced with some accusations by some other people who were young girls at the time Mm -hmm. that are adults now. And so he confessed at the time. He's in his 80s now. Right. But since then, he's gotten a lawyer, and his lawyer has said he recants his confession. Oh, my goodness. And that he was coerced, that kind of thing. And honestly, if he was truly repentant, he wouldn't be doing that. Right. So he's not repentant at all for his crimes. Right. I hope they charge him fully to the max of the law. And he has an upcoming trial. So I will keep you posted. But again, we are hoping over here that he faces the full extent of the law for that. Definitely. Yes. So, speaking of true crime within faith communities, I have found a new podcast that I'm currently binging called The Unlovely Truth. (laughs) Yes. Did you get a chance to listen? I did, and I'm loving the way that Lori breaks down those true crime cases in her episodes, and she just has such a unique perspective as a licensed private investigator. She does. She has my dream job. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) She's not only a licensed private investigator, but she is on the safety team at her church. So in her earlier episodes, she would bring a true crime case and tell you about it. And she would have on a guest to discuss that. And Mm -hmm. she has had some phenomenal guests. I hope you'll get to keep hearing some of those. And then in just this year, she has pivoted a little bit more toward church safety issues. Okay. And she has a wealth of information to share. Yes. With And so I have just been loving listening to the podcast. She's awesome. Guys, 
If you get a chance, you should definitely check out Lori Morrison's podcast, The Unlovely Truth, where she explores the intersection between faith and true crime. You can binge all of her episodes on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. And check her out on her socials. She has Facebook and Instagram. Instagram. Yes. So you won't regret it. She's right up our alley. Definitely. Today, I have a wild story for y'all that took place in South Central Florida in the 80s, about 30 miles from where I was born. And so where my mom and stepdad and my dad and stepmom (laughs) still live to this day. Yeah, the areas that I'm going to talk about, I'm really familiar with. You know, you think of Florida, you think of beaches and Mm -hmm. all that. But this is the part of Florida where there are lakes, cow pastures and orange groves about as far as the eye can see. Well, you went to Mayaka City, didn't you? I did. So yeah, you're you're, we're close to there. Really? And Mm -hmm. and you just described that so well. Yeah. (laughs) So now let me introduce you to a lady named Peggy Carr. She was a naturally very pretty lady with a short, chic haircut that was really stylish in the 1980s. She had a slim build and was nearly always happy, even though life hadn't always been super easy for her. Peggy was born in the farming community of Jasper, Alabama in 1947, to her parents, Charles and Jeline Alexander, who were both deaf. She was one of five siblings, and her parents being deaf was no big deal to her. I mean, it was her life, all she ever knew, it right? It was her normal. Yeah. She would often, you know, interpret for her parents. Her dad had a business, and she would help him with his business dealings. They would all sometimes in the winter huddle around one heater. And so, yeah, like the Loretta Lynn song says, they were poor, but they had love. Mm -hmm. They had a very close family, but financially with some hard times. Mm -hmm. Then Peggy would grow up, marry, and then they would move to South Central Florida. Sadly, her first marriage would end in divorce, but she had a daughter out of the marriage named Jeline after her mother, and they nicknamed her Sissy. Peggy and Sissy were always very close, like best friends, even when she was a little girl. But she was a single parent. She was. So I think that's more common with that. Right, right. Because you only have each other. Exactly. Peggy would end up marrying again, and she and her second husband had two boys together, a son named Alan and then another named Dwayne. But then sadly, her second marriage would end. Peggy found herself alone, raising three kids. Sissy, Alan, and Dwayne were all very close. Her children haven't been raised solely by her, and knowing all the heartbreak she'd experienced were very protective of sure. her. They said that she was a great mom and did her best to always stay cheerful, no matter what the circumstances were. But it was just uncommon to see her in a bad mood. But they were all ecstatic in 1988 when Peggy began a whirlwind romance with a man named Pi Carr. Hmm. So Pi, P-Y-E. He was a big old burly phosphate miner. So my dad and brother actually worked at the phosphate mines down there. Really? It's a pretty good job. Yeah. Okay. Is phosphate like soap? Is- yes. Okay. Toothpaste, everything is made of phosphate. Okay, so it's a mineral that you can get out of the Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. By this time, her oldest daughter, Sissy, was a young mother herself. I think she was 21 when she and Pi were married. And then Alan, he was in the military. He went into the Navy. And Dwayne was 16. So Pi, he had two teenage kids as well, an 18-year-old daughter named Tammy and a 16-year-old son named Travis. Peggy? And her kids and granddaughter all moved in with Pi and his kids in their Alturas, Florida home. And that's about 30 minutes away from Wachula, where I was born. And Peggy actually worked at the Nicholas's family restaurant in Wachula. She would travel back and forth. And she waitressed there. You know, Riley, Journey, Ailey, and I recently went to Florida, right? Mm-hmm. This past spring. Well, my mom took us to Nicholas's to eat lunch. Oh. Mm-hmm. Same restaurant where Peggy worked. Is this like a famous restaurant there or like a well-known? It's well-known. I mean, 
Wachula is it's okay. a very small town, so we don't have that many to choose from. But we love Nicholas's. Like okay. their food's great. If you hear my dog, he's chewing. Anyway, Peggy's kids, they were very excited. But Wachula is where I was born and where my dad lives and where my mom has her ministry, Lydia's house. And I knew that's where her ministry was, but I don't think I realized that that was the town you were born. Yes. I did not realize I was born there. The year that I was born, I don't know if you've ever heard the story switched at birth. Yeah. I've heard several. Which one was this one? Okay, this one was they were actually switched at birth in the hospital. And one of the little girls ended up dying and one of the mothers died. And then they found out that the kids were switched at birth. Oh, wow. And so there was this big custody battle over the remaining daughter. Mm, I've heard several stories like that. So I probably have heard that one. Well, that happened in Wachula the year that I was born. So there was actually a movie about it. It was called Switched at Birth, the Kimberly Mays story. Anyway, after that happened, they sent mothers, expectant mothers over to Walker Memorial Hospital, which is about 30 minutes away. And so that's where I was born. Okay. But I lived in, my family lived in Wachula. Think of how much different your story could have been, darling. Exactly. (laughs) Okay. So Peggy's kids, they really loved their new home in Alturas. I think like Pi had a good job and, you know, Peggy was a single mom and so they probably didn't have much. Mm-hmm. And then when they moved in with Pi, which is really nice, mm-hmm. they were like, this is awesome. And they loved the the little small town of Alturas. It was, it's not even a full town. It's just like a little community. But there is a big lake and then there's like cows and groves. Um, I'm wondering, were Pi's children as excited about them moving in with them though? They were, especially in the beginning. Okay. Yeah, the kids loved it there and felt like Peggy was finally able to have the life that she deserved. Everything was lively and fun, as you can imagine, in the car household. House full of teenagers. (laughs) Kids running around everywhere, playing heavy metal music, washing and fixing cars in the driveway, playing in the pool, splashing around the yard. Getting along like real siblings half the time. Mm -hmm. You know what I I mean? I can picture every bit of that. (laughs) There was a lot of laughter and arguments. Sure. It was a loud household. Yeah. But within six months, that newness would begin to wear off. And it was a lot. Sure. A typical blended family kind of situation. Peggy feeling disrespected at times. Uh, The neighbors complaining about all the noise and Peggy having to be the one to deal with it the kids bicker and back and forth from time to time and you know the kind of thing where the kids did not want to be told what to do by their step parents absolutely not I could totally get that yes and the one set would feel like the others were being treated better than the others and vice versa guys let me tell you something if you marry somebody with teenage or adult kids they might and might is the operative word, (laughs) grow to love your children, but they are not going to feel about your children the way that they feel about their own. There are some rare instances where that happens, but they, yeah. Very rare. That's why divorce, it wasn't Mm. really God's way. Yeah. So you start out and it's kind of a rough situation in the beginning, but you can't have these unrealistic expectations of your spouse. Don't allow your kids to get mistreated by any means. But if these are like grown behind kids or almost grown, mistreatment isn't like calling out bad behavior or asking them to wash the dishes. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Not kidding you. I know a couple who threw in the towel on their marriage over a step parent asking a 19 year old to wash the dishes more than they asked their own kid to Hmm. because it wasn't fair. Oh, goodness. Life is not fair. You know what? Those kids moved out of the house a short while after that. And those parents ended up alone. And it's been over 10 years and they're still alone. And they had a good marriage. Really? Besides. And just think those kids are probably grown and. Yeah, they had their own lives. Yeah. I do know what you mean. But on the flip side of that, that's what I've I've told Tim many times. Like if something were to happen to him now, I don't even want to remarry until my kids are grown. Absolutely. Because I don't want some man coming in thinking they can tell my my 
teenage boys what to do. Sure. And trying to take the place of their dad. I don't know. I just don't want that. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm just like, you know what? I could wait it out until they're grown. And if you can't, then know that about yourself and know you're probably not ready for a relationship. You know, I was a stepdaughter. You were a stepdaughter. Mm -hmm. My mom and stepdad are still married. I had conflict with my stepdad and he had to set me straight. Oh, it was plenty of times. Were they married when you were um, younger? No, not when I was younger, but when I was almost grown and he would tell me something and I would get fired up he would make me mad because his delivery wasn't I mean it was like a man and he didn't love me to start with I wasn't his kid he would just see dang this girl's lazy or this girl (laughs) you know what I mean I'm really glad that mom or my dad they they didn't allow us to come in between their their marriages because they have great marriages now and you know what now we all do love each other yeah so it takes time to, it you've got to grow into it, I guess. And I'm not like still hurting over him telling me to wash the dishes. It wasn't the end of the world. It was probably things I needed to hear. So I don't know. Anyway, I feel like Peggy and Pi were in the midst of all that. Yeah. And tensions were high to the point to where they were barely talking some days because mm. it affected their relationship. There's as no it does. way that it couldn't. Sure. Peggy, though, she still tried. Mm -hmm. You know, Pi worked a lot. And she did, too. But as the mom, you make the house. Mm -hmm. And she continued to try to do that. Um, She would still try to have family dinners every night. She was good to her stepkids. There were some tensions. But for the most part, they got along good with her. I think with stepdads, it's sometimes a little harder. Because their delivery isn't always the softest. Right. During one of these dinners... Dwayne, Peggy's youngest son, had checked the mailbox just before coming in to eat. And he brought a letter to the table from the mailbox that had been addressed to Pi Carr. And it was actually spelled right, like P-Y-E, which is weird. Like somebody who didn't know him would maybe spell it like Mm P-I-E. It's an odd name. Yeah. The note inside was typed out on a post-it. And it said... You and your so-called family have two weeks to move out of Florida forever or else you'll all die. This is no joke. Wow. Ominous. Yeah. So they were kind of laughing about it, especially the boys, the teenagers. They're like thinking it's one of their friends or they're thinking like probably each other did it. Well, the note clearly said this is no joke. (laughs) It said it's no joke. But Peggy, she was, she wanted to take it to the police. Everybody else was like, I'm sure it's no big deal. They just thought she was overreacting. Yeah. And she was like, well, y'all need to stop riding your motorcycles on other people's property. You know, they're teenage boys. And she's like, Anne, just be careful. And the boys joked, well, we better start packing because somebody's coming to kill us. They took it like about like 16 and 17 year old boys take stuff. And life went on, but tensions in the car house remained Mm -hmm. high. To make matters much worse, Pi had dated this teacher before Peggy, right? He had called this woman and asked her to meet him one night after work. While he's married to Peggy? While he's married to Peggy. Mm, And they sat outside in like their vehicles. And from what I understand, they were in separate vehicles. Like she was in one vehicle. He was in a different vehicle. But they were like the only. It was just them two out there. And he had told her he had made a terrible mistake. Mm. You can just you can imagine the conversation. Well, Peggy, because he had blown off a dinner that they were supposed to have at her sister-in-law's, at his sister's house. She was like, what is going on? So she and Sissy drove out to the mines. They were there. The vehicles there. And she was like, well, I guess that's what's going on. Mm. And she didn't confront him. She didn't? No. Like, she waited until he got home. <laughs> I would have been out better of that car than me right then. <laughs> because uh, me and my soon-to-be ex-husband <laughs> would be... <laughs> brawling one of us would have been found in the bottom of that mine yes (laughs) when he came home she did confront him and after an argument peggy ended up taking her kids and she went to stay at the tropical motel she left pie a note that read dear pie i do love you very much right now i'm at the point that i don't really know how you feel i told you that i could handle anything as long as i had you but now i'm just not sure I'm going to give you some time to think about us. 
I can't live like we've been. No respect from our kids. Not talking, not caring. I love you and I do want to be your wife. Key word is wife. I don't know if this is right or not what I'm doing, but I don't know what else to do. I can't imagine living without you, but I can if you don't want me. There's no question in my mind whether or not I want you and love you. Is there a question in your mind? I'll be okay if anyone is interested. I love you with all my heart. Peggy. Hmm. Makes me sad for Peggy. Well, he found her at the Tropical Motel and he told her he did love her and that he was really sorry and that he just wanted her to come home. We'll be back after a quick break. At the beginning of this year, one of my New Year's resolutions was to get my home decluttered and organized, especially my kitchen. Just going in there felt daunting. Even family meals were no longer enjoyable. I knew that I needed help because the thought of tackling it on my own was overwhelming. And then Melody told me about Shannon over at Functional Spaces. And let me tell you that meeting her transformed my kitchen from a cluttered mess to a cozy functional space that I once again can take pleasure in. Everyone has that one chaotic area in their home that requires excessive time and energy to manage. Many of us can identify more than one. For Darlene, that was just inside her kitchen door. Yes, everybody would come in and throw mail, keys, and coats all over the counters and chairs. I told Shannon this was such a source of stress for me. Why couldn't everybody just put their stuff away? And she explained that we could easily turn that area into a place of peace and productivity, a true functional space. We added a coat rack with key hooks and a small mail bin, and that has been a game changer. That's just one example of the difference she made. Functional Spaces is based in the Triangle and serves Central North Carolina. If you're ready to experience that same transformation, go to FunctionalSpacesNC.com and fill out the contact form. You will receive a link to schedule your discovery call to chat about your project area. Again, that's FunctionalSpacesNC.com. Tell her your friends at Hard Times and True Crime sent you. Well, that makes me think the other lady probably just rebuffed him. Because I think if she had (laughs) wanted to have him, he would have just said, okay, well, we're splitting up. (laughs) Well, Peggy and Pie, they seem to be in a better place after this. And love seemed to be back in the air. They were laughing and joking again. On October 23rd in 1988, Pi and some friends went on a hunting trip to South Carolina. And Peggy got up early that morning before day like she usually did. Because like I said, she worked in Wachula, which was a little over 30 minutes away from their home. And she liked to get up and get there a little early so that she could have a cup of coffee and a cigarette before she started her shift. Did your mama know her? I need to find out because literally we live there. We live in Wachula during this time. This was two years before my parents split up. My parents would have been hearing about all this. But yeah, after she got to work, she started feeling really strange. Her feet were hurting. Now she's a waitress. And so her feet always hurt. Yeah. (laughs) But this was a different kind of like a searing pain. It was unbearable. Her heart was beaten, felt like it was beaten out of her chest. She felt like she was having a heart attack, but they took her vitals. And even though her blood pressure was up a little bit, they didn't feel like she was having a heart attack, but she did start throwing up. Hmm. And so they told her, hey, you need to go home and get some rest. She went home. But she was in agonizing pain. Like pretty soon she she said it felt like her feet were on fire. She was crying. Peggy's children were obviously super worried. And they got a hold of Pi who came home early from his trip. They were shocked and mad because he didn't want to take her straight to the hospital. Instead, he called his sister to come over and to check her vitals, which... Again, they were a little high, but not alarming. Is his sister a nurse? She is. Okay. Yeah. So Pi told the kids it was probably just like the flu. Let her get to bed and get some rest. Finally, like later that night, as her symptoms progressed, he was like, okay, maybe she does need to go. And he ended up having to carry her, like physically pick her up and carry her like a baby out to the car because she couldn't walk. 
Hmm. So he put her in the car and they took her to Bartow. At the hospital, doctors did run like a kind of a battery of different tests. These were like basic tests, but they did check for poisoning, but nothing came up. She kind of started to improve some. Okay. Like she started not a whole lot. Like she was still very sick, but she did start improving. And so doctors were starting to think her symptoms were like psychosomatic. Mm. So they told her they felt like this was probably stress related to go home to rest, that kind of thing. You know, when she got home, her sister in law cooked her a meal, fried chicken, and there were these cokes. And so she she gave her her some, gave everybody some because she's like, if this is a sickness, everybody needs to stay hydrated. Okay, this was the eighties. I know that yeah. sounds weird. We know better than that now, but in the eighties, we was the eighties. Here, have we drank Sprite and Coke for everything. Yeah, <laughs> but it didn't seem to help. She was just getting worse. And two days later, her son Dwayne and Pi's teenage son Travis they started having really bad pain in their feet. Hmm. All right. Now, I was suspicious of Pi, but now they have his kid. So. Yeah. Dwayne was like, it's probably because I'm lazy. You know how it is when you are sit too long and your feet will go to sleep. Like I'm that. doing right now. <laughs> yeah. So he ran from his house to like the middle of town and back. And he said by the time he got back, it was like somebody were taking like pliers to his feet. Oh. He said it was agonizing wow the way that he was hurting that is bizarre and then came these waves of nausea but poor peggy she was just horribly sick well back at the nicholas's family restaurant in wachula sissy her daughter was confiding in her co-workers that she thought pie was poisoning her mom and knowing the issues, because Peggy, you know, she would go to work and talk to her closest friends about some of the issues they were having. And it really didn't seem too far-fetched to some of them. So they're suspicious of Pi. Yes. Which means either his kid accidentally got some, if he did it, his kid accidentally got some, or he did that to his own kid on purpose. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that that's kind of where things are at. After two days, you know, after Peggy got home from the hospital... Pi called an ambulance to come and pick Peggy up. She was that bad. Hmm. This time he was like, don't take her to Bartow. So they went to Winter Haven. That's where the Grady yes. styles where the people from the circus would winter yep. there. Winter Haven. So, But yeah, so they took her to the hospital and Peggy, she could barely talk. When the doctor came in, she just kept saying, Why? Why? Oh, that's awful. Dwayne and Travis were both admitted. They were vomiting in excruciating pain, and their symptoms were mimicking Peggy's. Well, the neurologist on call that evening at the Winter Haven Hospital was a Dr. T. Richard Hostler. He immediately suspected poisoning. He knew that they had done some tests, but he believed that that's what it was. So soon after... Arriving, Peggy had lost her ability to even speak. Wow. Now, because of her parents being deaf, she was able to sign. Oh, yeah. So that was a blessing. Her sister came in from Alabama and her son, Alan, he was granted leave from the military. And he was really mad because he had not been called until this had been going on for Mm. a week. They were not prepared for the way that Peggy looked and how sick she was, Alan hardly recognized his mother. Peggy was ghostly pale. Mm. She had on like a beanie because almost all of her hair had fallen out and she weighed less than 90 pounds. In a week? In a week. Oh my goodness. Yes. She's like wasting away. She's quick. wasting away. There were tubes all in her face. Peggy was actually incoherent most of the time. Mm. Like she would kind of slip in and out. She kept signing that her feet were on fire. Maybe it was a mercy, but Peggy did slip into a coma soon after she was visited by all of her kids. Because even though Dwayne was sick himself, he was worried about his mom. Mm -hmm. And he made so much of a fuss that they ended up wheeling him in there to see her. 
he was heartbroken over Aww. the way that she and looked. And he's only 16. Yes. That's her baby. Dwayne and Travis shared a room and they were not getting better either. They were rapidly losing weight, losing their hair, continuously sick on their stomachs and in horrendous pain. Finally, the test results came back that they had been poisoned with thallium nitrate. This was an odorless, tasteless chemical, and it was very easily dissolved in food and drink. I just watched a monk episode last week where somebody was poisoning people with that. Really? And I had never heard of that poison before. Yeah. So yeah, and it's lethal in very small doses. Also, it didn't show up on standard heavy metal poisoning tests. And so it was almost like the perfect murder weapon. Yeah. But where could it have come from? Because it had been outlawed since 1972 because of its toxic effect on humans. Hmm. And so it wasn't like just anybody could go up to the local drugstore and pick some up. Right. Although it was used in some chemistry labs, it was very, very rare. And it was only used under very tight restrictions. Their prime suspect immediately Mm -hmm. is Pi. Yeah. He did have motive. Yeah, but except his own son. Like, who could watch? Well, we, we as we know, right? people will poison their own children and watch them suffer horribly. So it's not out of the question. But yeah. Well, Peggy had over 200 times the maximum human exposure amount in her body. Good grief. So she's not going to. And Travis grief. and Dwayne, they had over 20 times the wow. maximum industrial exposure amount wow. so they knew this wasn't right. some kind of an accidental exposure but type of situation was, yeah the doctors they had hoped that they would be able to save Dwayne and Travis but after scouring medical journals they knew that it was really unlikely that Peggy was going to survive because it's kind of like radiation you might not die right away but once you hit a certain exposure level there's no coming back from that right And they can't get it out of your system. Yeah. And they hadn't been able to find an antidote. Yeah. This whole time they're looking, they're trying. Peggy had lost not only her ability to speak, but she had lost the ability to breathe on her own. When doctors and police informed Pi that his wife and boys had been poisoned, he did genuinely seem surprised and said he did not know anybody who'd want to hurt Peggy or the boys, much less kill them. Meanwhile, Peggy's sister, daughter, and son, Alan, were all very suspicious of Pi. They let police know everything that had been going on in that house, the infidelity, the tension, and the fact that Pi had told this other woman he wished he hadn't married Peggy, Mm -hmm. but it was too late. Then Larry Dubberly, Peggy's ex-husband and Dwayne's dad, and he believed that Pi and his sister, Carolyn, had poisoned Peggy and the boys. He had actually been in the room a lot. So their boys shared a room. And so he was in the room uh, like a lot with them, right? Travis's pie son. Mm -hmm. And he told the cops that after the cops came to him and told him, hey, it's poison. He said that when pie came back in the room that he was literally shaking and that he just couldn't even hardly talk. He was just so nervous that it was really odd. He also told investigators that one evening he had heard some commotion. He was outside the hospital room. And when he ran back inside the room to see what was going on, Pi and Carolyn, which is Pi Pi and his sister, they were in the room trying to feed Travis. And Travis was screaming, Larry, help me. They're trying to kill me. And Carolyn was like, we're just trying to help you. So from then on, Larry was worried about the food that anybody was bringing into that hospital, and he had the hospital put a stop to it. Good. Pi's sister is a nurse. She She might have access to some of that stuff. We will see. Okay. Larry also told investigators that Peggy informed him that Pi had life insurance policies for Dwayne, Travis, and Peggy. Well, so that's not surprising, is it? $80,000 for her and then sixty for the boys. Wow. 
And that was a pretty big bombshell. It wasn't mm-hmm. looking good for Pi. But investigators also heard from Peggy and Pi's preacher, the Reverend Bob Grant, that he did not believe that Pi would have done something like that. He said he was up at the hospital every day in that room with Peggy. He said, you never know. She might know that I'm here. Mm-hmm. He just said that the accusations and suspicions had doubled Pi's load of hurt. But the family members are the ones who know him better than the pastor. They do. But you have to understand, too, that that Travis did say all that. But you know that drug causes some hallucinations. Okay. All right. All right. There's that, too. You calmed me down a little bit here. And everybody, everybody knew how close Pi was to his son. And he was close to his son. Mm. That was like a barrier for cops. He looked very suspicious in every other way. But Dwayne, he seemed to be getting better, but Travis was not. He was getting worse. Now, this is Pi's son. son. He had lost control of his muscles, and they ended up having to put him on a respirator for his breathing, and he was in intensive care. He had, couldn't walk. It was bad. Mm. He was, um, things were not looking good for him. Then some test results came back. Dwayne and Travis were not the only ones with thallium in their systems. Sissy, Peggy's daughter, she had it in her system. Her two-year-old, Casey, and Pi had it in his system. Hmm. The baby had toxic levels. Pi had toxic levels in his system, enough to have made a smaller man very sick. But they're thinking because he was so large, he was only having some minor aches and pains. But he was chalking it up to he's going through a lot. Right. So even he did not realize that he had this in his system. But then the police wondered how he had just absorbed some of it in his through his skin because you can when he was poisoning the family. But in their search and nothing in their home. Yeah. Could they find that they were suspicious of? No evidence. Yeah. Was it this woman he met at the... You will oh, okay. see. <laughs> or, or a neighbor, <laughs> but I'm thinking that woman that he met. I don't know. Yeah. Investigators, they were coming down pretty hard on him because he was still their best suspect. They were questioning him hard. And finally, he decided to bring up that note. Oh, finally. And the cops are like, why didn't you tell us about this before? And he was like, I just didn't think about it, which is is weird to me. But anyway, so they got the note and they started analyzing it. And they knew very well that it was possible that Pi had fixed up the note himself. And they knew how to spell his name. Yes. So it was somebody who knew them Mm -hmm. for sure. If he did it, he probably thought this would take the suspicion off him and onto this mysterious culprit. Most people wouldn't have known to spell his name that way. That just stood out to them. I think it's his sister. We will see. <laughs> of course, two seconds ago, I thought it was that lady that he met. So, I mean, my, my mind is racing here like, oh, my goodness. But then there was this odd fact that Pi himself had been poisoned, mm-hmm. you know, and it wasn't just this teeny tiny amount either. Police started to wonder if possibly it was a, a case of the local water source being contaminated or, the you know, the, the family well. But tests confirmed that the well was not poisoned. And again, nobody else in the community was sick. They wondered if the thallium had come from pesticides because down there, you know, we spray in the Mm -hmm. groves. And so they wondered if it could have anything to do with that. But tests determined it wasn't that either. Then they started going through the car household and they had done this before but now they were like really scouring through everything and looking for the source of this poison and finally all their work paid off when they found an eight pack of 16 ounce bottles of coca-cola that had been tampered with they discovered that someone had put thallium inside the coke bottles and replaced the cap at that point They really thought, hey, this could be like a national product tampering Mm. 
situation because right before that, I don't know if you remember the Tylenol poisoning. Yes. People were scared to death to drink Cokes at that time because, Mm -hmm. you know, they just didn't know what was going on. And at that point, because thallium was a serious lethal banned chemical, the FBI got involved. Pretty soon, they discovered that there was no way for the Coke bottles to have been contaminated from the plant because of how they came down the line. Okay, not that they couldn't have been contaminated, but they wouldn't have all ended up in the same place. Oh, in the same batch. Yes. All of them but one were contaminated. Other people would be sick, yes. in other words. Yeah. They decided that that was just not possible, that it had happened either in the store or at their house. So investigators believed that it was targeted, though, and that Peggy had been the intended target. And Peggy's kids were quick to let them know who they thought it was, and they still thought that it was their good old stepdad. Dwayne said he didn't remember Pie shedding one tear while his mom was in the hospital. And her son, Alan, let them know how awful he had been to their mother lately, cheating on her. And they just thought he wanted out of the marriage. And that was his motive. But it was a little odd because Pi, if Peggy were his target to poison, would have known that Peggy preferred Pepsi and hmm. not Coke. Like she liked Coke. She would drink it. But you would think if I was going to buy something for some to poison somebody, I'm going to buy their favorite thing to yeah. make sure that they drink it. Yeah. Does that Absol- make sense? Absolutely. These were just little things that were kind of standing out to investigators. On March 3rd, 1989, after four months of suffering, four months. I was getting ready to say that. What? Four months? Four she months suffered? of suffering. Wow. 41-year-old Peggy Carr died at 6.51 p.m. at Winter Haven Hospital. Mm. Her children were devastated. And I had read newspaper articles from then where they were so hopeful she was going to wake up. They are like, the oh. doctor said she might. Mu- they were hope. really holding out hope. Oh. Now their hopes were dashed. Although Dwayne was released two months earlier in December, her son, he still had a limp. His balance was off and his weight had dropped from 165 down to 92 pounds. Wow. His father, though, worked him and had him lift in, started out with these two pound weights, had him swim in. And really forced him to push through the pain. And he was not happy about it. But he made him do it. Because he said, if you don't, you're not going to be right for the rest of your life. He did not appreciate it at the time. But he came to see that that really was what helped him recover Mm -hmm. as well as he did. Physically, he was recovering. But emotionally, he was having a difficult time dealing with the loss of his mother. He was kind of bouncing around from relative to relative. He went from Frostproof, which that's where my mom lives, to Alabama, to Fort Meade, to Gainesville, to South Carolina. And then he ended up going to stay with his brother, Alan, who had been in the military in Orlando. He was trying to find his new normal. Mm -hmm. He had hoped to go get his GD and possibly join the military himself. That was his new goal, something to aim for. Yeah. At the time of Peggy's death, Travis was still in the hospital, unable to walk in serious condition. A year after the poisonings, investigators had some theories, but no suspects. One year later. Wow. Travis was finally released from the hospital, but had to relearn to walk first with a walker and then with braces. He was in physical therapy, very slowly regaining his health, but his life had been saved. Pi, Travis, and his 19-year-old daughter, Tammy, moved out of their home and in with relatives. And if you're not guilty, that would be kind of scary to live there. Not knowing what's going on. If that kid thought that still thought that his dad had been the one that did that. Oh, I know. Investigators could not afford to have tunnel vision. No matter how suspicious Pi looked to them, they had to look at everything. As good investigators will. Exactly. The FBI developed a profile of the poisoner. And after learning the cars never locked their doors... And we never did either when we lived in Florida when I was younger, like in that time. And that two of their family dogs had suddenly passed away after a mysterious illness 
they had been in severe pain, had lost hair, and then they just died. So they started questioning neighbors because this community was only like, they only had like 600 people in the whole community. They were literally able to question every single person in that altruist community. The FBI profile worked up a person who felt like they had been wronged somehow and wanted to get even somebody who was kind of a coward, like wouldn't necessarily go to your face yeah, with conflict, but would like to watch you suffer Mm -hmm. this evil genius type of a person, somebody who thought was smarter than everyone else and would never get caught. And the FBI profile would also read that the person would have a very high intellectual level, like an intelligence level. And thallium, you know, like like I had mentioned before, wasn't something that just anybody could get a hold of. And so that right there, because it was so difficult to get a hold of, that narrowed down their suspect sure, list yeah. automatically. One interview that the police had with the car's closest neighbor stuck out to them. When police would ask other members of the community, why do you think anybody would want to hurt them? They would be like, I don't know. You know, they're good people. Just like, you know, everybody's yeah. in shock when a neighbor dies. Well, the next door neighbors, George and Diana Trapel, George said, perhaps to get them to move. <gasps> ah, so the, <laughs> gosh, all that smarts just went right out the window there. So it was just a really odd response. It sounds off like that letter. Huh? Right. Yeah, exactly. So they started thinking about the letter and just all these different things. And so they started looking into these neighbors just to be thorough because Still, like, how bad do you got to hate your neighbors to literally kill them? Pa- George and Diana, there had been some issues between the families. The car kids played their loud music. They blared their TV. And it got on the Trapel's ever-loving nerves. And then there were those dogs who chased their cats. But it was mostly Diana who was confrontational. She was kind of the dominant one. In their relationship, she would come over to the house. Like, in fact, she had just come over to the house a few days earlier and went slap off on Peggy because of the boys playing their loud music out in the yard while they were washing their car. And she was cussing and yelling. And that wasn't the first time they got mad at them one time and called the city on pie because he had been like converting a shed into a little apartment out back. For the boys, their neighbors ended up calling the city, you know, because he was doing it without a permit and that kind of thing. So when these incidents happened, though, Peggy would go out and tell the boys, look, we got to live beside these people. Just please keep the music down. You know, she, she wanted to be a peacemaker, but they were boys and they were like, these, they're silly. You know what I mean? Mm Mm-hmm. I'll so, do what I want. Kind exactly. Of thing. Yeah. Yeah. But the last time when Diana was cussing her out, mm. she I think she had had enough of it. And she was like, look, the music is not really even that loud. And I'm not going to make them turn it down. Because I think she was used to coming over there and kind of bullying Peggy. Yeah. And Peggy would just be like, I'm really sorry. You know, that kind of thing. This time she kind of just stood her ground. She was like, yeah, they're not even doing anything. Like, calm down. They're kids. Still, though, that stuff doesn't really look. It's kind of common neighbor stuff. Like, we have a great relationship with our neighbor. But one night, so his window is like right by our house. And we had our son's dog over here. We were at Elijah's wedding oh. and we left him like in his kennel mm-hmm. for hours Uh-oh. and he barked and barked and barked and barked. And by the time we got back home, he was so frustrated with us. Like Your neighbor he was, was like, you're a great neighbor, but I cannot I handle that with dog. that dog. <laughs> and, you know, it just happens. We could have gotten mad and been like. Oh, my gosh. But, you know, we settled it and we were wrong and that kind of thing. But, yeah, I mean, it happens. Neighbors get frustrated with each other. Yeah. But this sounds like it had been ongoing. and Yeah. And they're older. And I do get it. Like, I don't love lots and lots of noises. I'm sure the kids were loud. And they were kind of close neighbors. But there's a way to talk to people. Yeah. And to try to work things out. And I just don't think they went about it the right way. But anyway, still. 
you know how many neighbors have trouble with each other? Like that is common. Well, we it just, really is. Yeah. And so George, though, he had always been pretty nice to the family, at least civil. Like he would wave at him and smile at him in the driveway. The Carr family actually kind of felt sorry for him because they felt like, oh, he has to live with that mean, mean lady. Woman. <laughs> and she was kind of domineering, that kind of thing. So if someone were going to poison them, that wasn't a family member, though, these two would have had the easiest access. They would have known when they weren't home. Yeah. They would have known their schedule. So they decided to re-interview George, Tripal, and Diana. But George told them, you know, I don't know anything about thallium. I don't know anything about chemistry. Diana, she was an orthopedic surgeon. But George, he didn't really do anything much. I mean, I think he kind of lived off of her. He said that he was a computer programmer, but I'm not sure how much business would have been booming in the late 80s. When asked about an alibi, he said that he usually went to work with his wife. And so he couldn't have done it. But it's pretty unlikely that he's just going to go hang out while she's doing surgeries at the hospital. They soon discovered that George fit the FBI profile to a... T. George and not her? George. He had an extremely high IQ, which she did too. They Mm -hmm. both had. In fact, they were members of the Mensa Club. Do you know what that is? I did. Hang on a minute. Let me think and I'll tell you. No, no, I don't. Okay, so it's this social club for literal geniuses who have an IQ in the top (laughs) 2%. So yeah, I'll never be a part of that club then. But I guess geniuses like to hang out. Together, With other I guess so. After doing a background check, they discovered that George had lied to them and that he did, in fact, have a background in chemistry. Oh, years ago, he had actually spent time in prison for being involved in a methamphetamine ring in the 70s that produced $7.5 million worth of the stuff in North Carolina. Oh, my gosh. This guy's like breaking back. I was going to say, I was thinking Walter White. That's like a yeah. true life yes, Walter White. It is. And guess what chemical he used all the time? That thallium, thallium nitrate. Thallium nitrate, yeah. Yes. While serving time in prison, George taught chemistry to the inmates. He is the real life Walter White. I'm yes. Also, George wasn't confrontational. He would have been likely to go next door and talk to the car's fate. You know what I mean? And Maybe be, this is where Breaking Bad got their idea for this. I really show. wonder. I I'm really wonder. Too. Yeah. So, and who knows what kind of crap he was taken from Diana? You know how we wives can be when we're aggravated about a situation. Anyway, bit, yeah. like normal wives. Imagine somebody who's, mm. you know, super domineering and that kind of thing. Investigators just had this gut feeling. They felt at that point like George was their guy. But they couldn't go on a feeling. What well, Right, yeah. Right? Because there was literally no evidence to back that up. And this was not a typical murder. And George was not a typical murderer. So they knew that their typical techniques were not going to work on him. It wasn't going to do for them to take him down to the station and interrogate. He thought he was smarter than everybody else. He would clam. It just was not going to work. And they knew that. But they also believed that if he got away with this, it was not going to be his last murder. No. And the Carr family and Peggy's children... They had been in so much pain from everything Mm. that had been taken from them. Peggy's son, Alan, went back to serve in the Navy. He actually attempted suicide very shortly after. Thank God he was not successful. But the killer almost claimed another life. Right. You know, and so they really wanted justice for this family. So I don't know if you've ever heard of Polk County's sheriff. He's like famous on TikTok. It's Grady Judd. Oh, yes. He was actually on the um, interview, like, talking about all this. Oh. So I can just imagine him thinking through all this stuff with the FBI, of course, because. Yeah. And, but, yeah. But what are the chances that you would have somebody so um, smart also yes. involved in that who could maybe match wit for wit? Right. The police started this undercover operation. They knew that they were going to have to get inside information somehow. 
they were surveilling him. They were doing everything that they could, but it was not enough. He was smart. George, he just wasn't going to make these common criminal mistakes that other people made. So they brought in this woman named Susan Gorich, who was a Polk County cop, and she went undercover. They'd had this plan, and they felt like she was the perfect fit to go undercover. And so she agreed to do that. George and his wife were hosting this murder mystery weekend at their Mensa club. Well, that's uh, ironic. Yes, it was a huge hobby that they loved. So this particular one was called a Mensa murder weekend voodoo for fun and profit. And this, it was a three day event. George wrote the stories. He wrote the mysteries. They created this character for Susan that that George would be drawn to. Right. Mm -hmm. So since he was the submissive one in his marriage, the profiler suggested that Susan play up to his ego. Mm -hmm. She was going to be a victim. So she was coming out of an abusive marriage and kind of be needy and like really need a friend and really look up to George where he could be the hero and because he probably seriously needed the ego boost. Susan's character was Sherry Gwynn. She registered for the murder mystery weekend and she met him right away. You know how you'll go into an event and there'll be the people there taking the tickets Mm -hmm. and the sign. George was the first person that she saw when she walked in. He got her signed up and immediately he was kind of drawn to her. Mm. She was good at what she did. Yeah. Investigators were able to get her into George's life that way. I think it's just so fascinating how this is playing out. It's it gets better. Oh, it gets so much better. So at the murder mystery party, he stood up and he starts telling these jokes about lawyers and they're kind of mean spirited jokes like Susan, you know, AKA Sherry. She got the sense that he despised lawyers for some reason. And so when George asked her about her background, she told him that she was divorcing her abusive husband who was a lawyer. Oh, she was she so stinking that. smart. That yes. is very smart. Yeah. She was able to connect to George by seeming to be like in awe of him and his brilliance. The poor thing, she had to keep up with another character because, you know, they give you other, they give you a character at the, they do, yep. at the mystery. So her murder mystery character was Roberta. I mean, like just thinking, this is kind of getting convoluted, like to yes. try to keep up with all the things. Yeah, yeah. it is. You know, you have your little script yep. and your description. And so she was very shocked when she read this description written by George that said, Few believe that they can be killed by voodoo, but no one doubts that they can be poisoned. When a death threat appears on the doorstep, prudent people throw out all their food and watch what they eat. Hardly anyone dies from magic. Most items on the doorstep are just a neighbor's way of saying, I don't like you, move or else. Wow, that is crazy. Yeah. So during the weekend, George and Sherry, they got close and he started telling her he and his wife were planning to move to Sebring, which is where my Nana lives, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, because Diana had bought a practice over there. He invited Sherry because he knew she was having a hard time. He knew she was just leaving her miserable husband. So he was like, hey, I have an idea. We weren't planning to rent out our house, but... We'll rent it to you. I mean, we trust you. Mm. And she's like, okay. So she can get in there and search for oh that Oh, my stuff. gosh. Yes. When it was switched to where it was her property. Yeah. And it was his idea. That is crazy. So she's going to rent and now she it's legally so hers. She's allowed to do that. Yeah. So anyway, it was the perfect opportunity So during this whole time, the two of them are staying close and she's meeting with him regularly in public, of course, several times they're going to parks and she's playing like, I don't know what to do about my Mm ex-husband, you know, that whole thing. And they're having lunch. He suggested that she ruin her ex-husband's reputation by writing a letter saying that he molested a child. Oh, gosh, that's diabolical. That is diabolical. He also confided in her that when he was in college, he and his friends would pick up hitchhikers and they would have these Oreo cookies with hallucinogenics Gosh, that they would give to the hitchhikers and just watch the effects that the drugs would have on them. Wow. 
And they would just kind of like laugh about it. Yeah, that's crazy. And this shows just how devious and sneaky I feel like he was. Yeah. Well, while all this is going on, a a surveillance team is watching his every move. Yeah. I just love, love, love that he thinks he's so smart. Oh, me too. And he's playing right into their hands. But they were concerned for her safety. Sure. As well. They had also discovered that he was kind of a person that enjoyed sitting back and watching other people suffer. So it's not like he's going to shoot somebody or Mm -hmm. like stab somebody. He he gets a kick out of just like sitting back and watching. Yeah. And repeatedly, he would almost beg Sherry to come back to his new house with him because he said he wanted to give her a grand tour. And she just kept putting it off. Well, can I take a rain check? In fact, I, I listened to some of the surveillance and watched some of the uh, footage that they had. And she would just be like, well, can I take a rain check? Or I have, you know, have this and that. So she would always try to meet with him in public, which was smart. They had found some chemical in his place that they had sent off for testing. But it, had to, it takes some time. Mm-hmm. I mean, even with that first round of testing, it took time before they found out what it was. Well, finally, it came back, and in his garage, there was thallium nitrate, and not just traces of it. They also found other chemicals in thousands of journals and books. One homemade journal that uh, described thallium as the choice of criminal poisoners, and its fatal doses and effects were, like, all written out and, like, Mm. described. They also found a copy of The Pale Horse by Agatha Christie, Mm -hmm. which was about a series of murders that were uh, committed by using thallium poisoning. Hey, I have a great idea. Okay. Agatha Christie made me think of it. Mm -hmm. We have some Agatha Christie shirts and mugs. We do. So the first five people that are members of our um, Facebook group, Hard Times and True Crimes, the group, not just the page. If you comment about this episode in the group and share the link, we will send you a free shirt or mug. Absolutely. Yes. Of course, I'll have to get your address so we can ship those to you. Yeah. So if you do that, screenshot it and then um, you can either email us at hardtimesandtruecrimes at gmail.com or you can just message us Yeah. either way. Yep. Yep. So if you'll do that, and we will send you out a shirt or a mug. Absolutely. That's a great idea, Melody. Okay. So on April 7th in 1990, 41-year-old George Tripal was arrested at his Sebring home. He was arrested with first-degree murder in the March 3rd, 1989 death of Peggy Carr. He was also charged with six counts of attempted first-degree murder and numerous counts of product tampering. Mm. After searching his Sebring home, they discovered a secret soundproof dungeon hidden underground with no windows or inside doorknob. Oh, my gosh. There was a platform bed with wooden stirrups. And what was ropes, he planning? And all kinds of torture devices, even a pulley system to like lift someone up in the air. Investigators strongly believed that that was created for Susan Gorich, their investigator. Oh my gosh. Yeah, he was kept trying to get her to come over. Yes. Oh my gosh. He was getting, he was like, like serial killer. They believe that that is who that room was made for. For her. Yes. Thank God. They said that when she, she saw go. that, she literally had to, like, it took her breath away. Like, she I had to am leave. sure. Can you imagine how that would feel? No. That is just, that's, that's chilling. Like, that gives me cold chills. Yes. So, ugh. Peggy's kids and the Carr family were shocked. In fact, it took Peggy's kids and sister hearing all the evidence in court to even believe that George was their mother's killer and not Pi. During the trial, George's attorneys argued that investigators had no right to search his home and without a standard, you know, warrant issued by a judge. But the prosecution argued that he had turned the home over to Susan and the other law enforcement officers did have the right to search his home without a warrant because he had abandoned what was left there and the items that were left there. You know, he had turned the home over to Susan Gorich. Law enforcement has the right to lie to suspects. 
They're yeah. allowed to do that. Yeah. So she was within her rights when she was lying to him. She's allowed mm-hmm. to do that. Ultimately, the judge did decide with the prosecution that he had turned the home over to her. Wow. And so it was fair game. The prosecutor laid out the story that they believed George and his wife were fed up with the loud music. The kids always out in the yard with their bikes, their dogs, always chasing their cats and other aggravations that had just built up over time. They believed in October 1988, he spiked seven of the eight 16 ounce bottles of Coca-Cola with thallium nitrate, which was, you know, of course, this highly toxic heavy metal that's near impossible to get a hold of. Then he sneaked them onto the neighbor's stoop, Mm -hmm. their porch, knowing Peggy, she was, she was home the most. And so naturally she drank them and he knew that people were in and out so much there that nobody was going to know. Sure. You know how it got there or where it was. They were just going to drink it. Uh, Same here. Oh, absolutely. (laughs) If I see a coat, I'm like, oh, cool. Kurt bought coat. You know what I mean? If I found some on my porch, I would think, oh, somebody came and dropped us off some Cokes. Yeah. So they laid out that he just had no conscience or qualms and about murdering his neighbors. And that if it had not been them, it would have been somebody. Yeah. If he had, if he had not been called. Yes. He would have continued that. That's absolutely. Yeah, that's right. And that's what was next. Like he would have done it again. He was not finished. The prosecution painted a picture of George being this evil genius. George was found guilty and he was sentenced to death by electrocution. Pi Carr said he thought the death penalty should be given the same way he'd given it to Peggy. He said he thought George should be given a Coca-Cola a day and let him wonder which bottle the poison would be in. Mm, He said Peggy was loving, sweet, concerned, beautiful, and talented and had a personality that very few people had. Unfortunately, Pi and Peggy's kids would end up fighting in court over her belongings. I hate that. Yeah. Peggy's kids said they felt like he held a grudge against them for accusing him of their mother's murder. It's so sad when stuff like that happens. There's a lot of pain Mm -hmm. involved. They probably needed somebody to blame, somebody to be angry at. And then he's probably like in shock and feels betrayed. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of anger and suspicion and just horrific pain. In a 2011 interview with The Ledger, Dwayne said he was really convinced that they had had the wrong guy when they first arrested George. He learned pretty quick throughout the trial that they had the right guy. He said he forgave him years ago, though, and he said that if God could forgive him, then he could forgive George. Wow. He woke up one day and decided he was sick and tired of hating the man. He had given his life to the Lord. Mm Mm-hmm. And that he had just let go of his anger. His sister, Sissy, also said that after two years of counseling, she worked through her anger and also forgiven George. Alan said he had no doubt of his guilt. He said it had been so hard seeing his mother and the condition she was left in by the poison. Mm. He said the doctors had to stitch her eyes closed because she couldn't control them. But he doesn't think killing George is going to make the world a better place. If the sentence gets commuted to life, then he's okay with that. He said he's a Baptist and he doesn't want to see the man die. Pie Carr felt differently. I do too. He said when he went to the chair, he wanted to be there to watch it. Unfortunately, though, in 2020, at 76 years old, Pie Carr would pass away in Bartow, Florida. He was survived by his wife of 25 years, Mary Lou Carr. His daughter, Tammy, of Bartow, his son, Travis, of Bartow, and two stepchildren. As of today, George Trappell has continued to deny any involvement in Peggy's murder and the other poisonings, and he is still on death row longer than any Florida inmate. Why is that? Do you know? Well, he keeps on trying to appeal, and for a long time, it didn't work. But I think he actually does have an appeal coming up now. Before we close the episode, if you're a member of our public group, Hard Times and True Crimes on Facebook, and you comment on the episode post for this episode, yes, 
And if you want to share it on your page and screenshot that, you can email us at hardtimesandtruecrimes at gmail.com and uh, let us know that or message us through our website if you like. Mm -hmm. And the first five responders will get a free uh, T-shirt or mug with Agatha Christie on it. And unfortunately, we can only do this for uh, United States uh, members at this time. We do have some that are in other countries, but for now. Sorry, guys. Sorry. (laughs) We still love you, though. We do. I've learned a thing or two about Florida over the years because that's where my wife's from, but I still love her. And one of the most interesting things that I've learned is the existence of the Florida man. And if you don't know about the Florida man, well, I encourage you to take the time to Google Florida man headlines. There are entire websites, Twitter accounts, and radio programs dedicated to highlighting all the weird crazy and interesting things that the Florida man gets arrested for. Headlines like Florida man tries walking out of store with chainsaw in his pants or Florida man arrested for calling 911 because his cat can't come in the nightclub or Florida man tries to bring four foot emotional support snake on a plane and the list is never ending. But there's one thing the Florida man doesn't do. And that's miss a single episode of Hard Times and True Crimes. So you make sure you tell everybody you know, even if they're from Florida, to check us out. Till next time, goodbye.